Lighthouse. Welcome to the Movie Lighthouse, shining a light through the fog of film. My name's James. My name's Nico. <laughs> I'm Wyndham. I'm Laurie. How is everybody? You all right? Yeah, we're yeah. good. I'm yeah. absolutely good, thank you. Are we good? Yeah, yeah pretty good. Pretty good, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm yeah. a bit nasally. I'm a little bit worse for wear. It was my birthday, birthday yesterday. Yeah, was birthday. Birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah, thank you very much. Did we sing, James? No, but we don't need to do it now. Okay. Right. You're looking quite good for 30. I think I've seen much, <laughs> much worse 30 year olds than yourself. <laughs> All right, so before we get into it, um, we made a little bit of an error on the on our last podcast. Whoa. It was a maths mistake. Oh, so I, I'm not going to do the maths for this. Yeah, I'm not doing the maths again. Cause I get to, it's too under pressure, you know. It's like, I thought I was quite good at maths, but maybe I'm not. But apparently, um, washing. we gave it an average of 45.25. And it should have scored 35. So, In the mouth of madness. Yeah. yeah. 35. So 35. Out of a, what? 100. Oh, my God. Poor yeah. in the mouth of madness. <laughs> I, I, like, I it. like it again. I like, I like it again. <laughs> Once I've, you know, I've got over... Got, bloody hell. I like I it. Blame, I, blame Nico, nice aftertaste. I blame Nico's TV and technology. Because it did, did render it in real clarity for us, didn't it? Yeah, I guess you're not supposed to watch that film in such high definition. <laughs> I should have yeah. taken my glasses off. But no, <laughs> this is an interesting right. point that's made me start thinking because you know, like films like A Razorhead and you know these kind of things that you you see. When you saw A Razorhead, you saw that on a VHS. It had a quality about it, this that, and the other. And do you really want to see A Razorhead in crystal clear? I don't know. I think it's a different experience. You know, obviously the formats that you you look at. Film what film you're film. saying is you Real actually effect. need to watch it in a machine that has an eraser head. Well, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah it does, <laughs> doesn't that, it? Yeah. You're right. Yeah. But well, there's so you know, the media that you're watching the film on, and obviously nowadays with obviously mobile phones and all that stuff. And I know Lynch himself said it's complete bullshit. No one can watch a fucking film on <laughs> sorry on uh, you know a, a phone or a tablet. We shouldn't be doing that. But that's obviously a medium we now have to look at. Um, but anyway, I just find it interesting, you know, what... I'd like to say about that, though, that the new, the recent revisit of Twin Peaks that he did, yeah. I don't think that stands up to scrutiny of watching it on a decent screen. You know, mm. you really see... I mean, I know he's selling a kind of crapness as part of his thing, yeah. but, you know, it really looked crap, and the scenes Maybe were... it's your TV. Maybe everything <laughs> you're watching... <laughs> just... Maybe, yeah. God, <laughs> I got totally gone. <laughs> oh. But it's bad quality. If it's a bit fuzzy around the edges, it leads itself to a bit more to that sort of dream experience. If it's too sharp, is it yeah. exposed? Do dream if like it's that? too sharp, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I yeah. I mean, I felt with you know that was when I was watching Twin Peaks that the fact that it was, you know, you're looking at it in quite a nice sharp medium, and then you've got these really old school crappy film. Uh, that I love yeah which are great but yeah. I don't think they stand up to watching on a big curved screen you know right. you're watching that I actually think it worked better because I saw some of that on the on the, the big thing downstairs and I watched some of it on my iPad upstairs mm. other um, brands of tablets apply and, <laughs> um, although you can send us some iPads if you like yeah yeah oh yeah we're not the BBC <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. iPads which are great yeah. <laughs> um, yeah when I watched a few episodes on that I actually thought it looked better so, mm. David Le- David Lynch, you know, eat your words, mofo. Anyway, we've got we've we've had some mail, which is exciting. Oh, oh great! Yeah. yeah, what they're saying. So this is uh, from Conor McDonnell, all the way from Canada, um, and he's talking about um, our last show. I really enjoyed this, guys. Lots of laughs and good movie choices. I love In the Mouth of Madness. So I'm a bit miffed. Why don't you kick the shit out of Event Horizon next and finish me off good and proper? <laughs> <laughs> We'd really like to hear you guys take on from Dust Till Dawn. Yeah. The opening monologue in the convenience store by Michael Parks inspired Kevin Smith to write Red State and Tusk just to work with him. Mm. I know lots of stupid stuff too. Not sure what that quite meant at the end. But yeah. um, I take it it's talking about Tusk, the film that came out. Yeah. Years ago. I love that film. It is good. It is yeah. good. And I, it I turned into a walrus. That's it. I Brilliant. didn't get halfway through with it though, but yeah, it's it very great. disturbing because it's body dysmorphia, which is my kind of yeah. disturbing thing. Right, anyway. That's his thing. Right, so we've got some news. Um, we have our movie lighthouse advent calendar. It's day three at the moment. Has everybody been looking at the advent calendar? I've mm. seen the first two. 
Well, I only just did the last one, so... What was the last? I haven't actually seen them. What are they? What were they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so oh glad God. you said it first. Have you got any good ones? <laughs> I, was, I was kind of thinking, shall I do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. We, yeah, just fill us in a little bit, Joe. Yeah. Well, we've, got, we've just uh, got a few pictures that we're going to put. Um, we're going to put some stuff up every day um, on the run up to Christmas, and then we've got something quite exciting over Christmas. Mm. We are going to do the twelve days of Christmas. So every day over the twelve days of Christmas, Laurie, which starts on. Well, yeah, you see, you've informed me. I thought the 12 days of Christmas was the lead up to, but it turns out it's the 12 days starting from Christmas Day itself, after. Yes. Leading well, up to Epiphany. Heavens be <laughs> praised. And Epiphany, ooh. Is oh. actually, Epiphany is actually the day, if, if this is your particular thing, would be the day that the, you should celebrate Christmas, if you're being particularly old-fashioned about it, because it is the day the three wise men arrived with the gifts uh, the dear Lord baby Jesus. Oh, Did he not get that fantastic. on Christmas Eve? Didn't you love that? You, you'd have thought, wouldn't you? Yeah. You'd have thought they'd have arrived for <laughs> Christmas. How wise are they? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to um, we're releasing um, bonus podcasts every day across uh, the twelve days. Across the twelve days. So uh, well, what, what, what? What's the subject? Well, that? I'm going to kind of keep it a surprise, like Christmas itself. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, do listen to those. They should be pretty good. All right, so a bit of news. Anybody, anyone been watching Stranger Things? Yeah, oh, I have Stranger seen Stranger Things. Things. Just brilliant. Have, have we all watched all of them? I've got three to go. Okay, I've got three to go. What did you think of those last three, Lloyd? <laughs> 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 Reviews of film has never seen before. Reviews of film has never seen. Yeah. Oh, he's off on the save that actually. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it started. I, I really loved the first um, series, and I knew I was in for a treat the minute I saw the credits. That opening credits, that sort of uh, italic, the fallibility of the italic sort of fuzzing a bit, um, that red Stranger Things crossing over, and the music, I was like, right, okay, this is made by someone that loves the kind of films that I love. And obviously it being set at the time of when I was a kid, so adored it. Uh, first series, great. Second series, I was like, oh, because, uh, you know, you're not getting as many reveals. You're not, you know, first of all, meeting these characters for the first time kind of thing. Um, but... Sort of three episodes in, it starts sort of cranking up a gear. It sort of repeats a little bit with the whole... Now, rather than Christmas tree lights, we've got drawings. You know, the whole map bit. And Mum's figuring it out. She's a cool mum. Um, but yeah, just it kicked off and I, I love it. Yeah, completely love it. When, I quite like the fact that um, Burke Carter J from oh, Aliens is in. Yes. He's redeemed himself. He's redeemed himself, yeah, yeah. So the, the guy in Aliens, yeah. who is the company man... There's a bad call, Ripley, there's a bad call. Indeed, him. He, he? He's, he's the guy who runs the, the whole square building now. The, yeah. the Doctor? Yeah. yeah. He's aged, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. Oh, he's but, but, all right. But uh, clearly we're, there's spoilers involved in this, right? Yeah, now. yeah. So you start off thinking he's going to be another version of... Yeah. Matthew Burke. Bodine? Oh, yeah. Oh, right, the first yeah. one? Papa. Yeah, so you think he's going to be another kind of proper from a now, replacement... Really? For him, um, and then he he does he does redeem himself as the season goes on, and you and you realise that actually he's not this yeah, murderous yeah. awful. Because when you see him anyway, you see person. Bert, and it's like yeah, right, he's exactly. a shitbag. We cannot trust this dude. Yeah. Mm. And then there's that moment. It's like oh good old boy. Yeah. 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 It's great. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Nico? Um, I really enjoyed it, and I watched the whole thing when it came out sort of over a period of maybe 48 hours Sweet. much to the joy of my family <laughs> <laughs> where's daddy gone it's stranger things come on um, but uh, I, I didn't enjoy it as much as the first one and it's like you're saying about the the stuff being revealed you kind of got a much clearer idea of what's going on already mm. also there's something about Eleven in the first one and I I hate it's not as superficial as just she had a crew cut there's something so vulnerable and um, you know, yeah. the childlike breakability of her that didn't really seem to exist in the in, in the yeah. second season, which for me was a really compelling factor in making it work. You know, the fact you really, you know, it's, it stimulates or, or brings up that protective instinct from you. You'd like to get into the screen just to yeah. you know, give her a hug and say, don't worry, I'll help you. Yeah. And now it's like, God, she's the last person who needs any help. Mm. Now you know what she can do. Um, which... You know, you've, I've seen that in other films. I, in my quest to find 
actually, I'm not going to go on too much about because we're going to talk about some of our favourite films of the year. Yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. similar element in what I did pick for my favourite film of the year. So I'm not going to go into that now. But there, that I think that's a real uh, trigger point for me is little girls that need help and are very vulnerable. Yeah. That sounds really <laughs> <laughs> To help and Have protect. Have you got a ice cream? Not to, to you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to stop now. I'll just <laughs> turn myself into Harvey Wine still. So I'll stop. Um, but yeah. yeah, that really worked in the first one. It wasn't, such a, that this, it wasn't yeah. such a thing for the second one. And I, I generally thought, you know, with the first one, when it's suddenly, when you suddenly realise, oh my God, we're watching E.T. here. Yeah, well, the things get yeah. referenced now. It's kind of like you know that these things are going to get referenced. You know that they've got a thing about um, you know, the old Spielberg movies of the eighties, and yeah, it's just giving you a bit more of the same. So I wasn't as compelled. Yeah, I all love, I'm going to say yeah. is Dustin. I just think he's brilliant. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think he makes such a show. The the other kids are good, but you know, he's just it, it, very. Watchable. It became his kind of season. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, when when you watch Dustin, he fills in holes in your memories of the people that played roles like that in the 80s. So mm. when I think back about Goonies and I think back about E.T. and I'm sure Dustin was in them. It's been signed for a third season as well. Oh, has which it? I, yeah. I presume is just going to be a really horrible descent for Hopper into a painful death because he was inhaling all of that stuff in the Upside Down order. Ah, it, it's yeah. just awful, right? So, But nobody seemed to... <laughs> my yeah. It's just... This weird stuff being released into the air. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hanging yeah. It. And yeah. That can't be good for you. That's yeah. going to play havoc, isn't it? That is, it's got to. It's going to put a road through him. Um, I love uh, uh, the, the actual Goody's guy. What's his name? The actor's name? The boyfriend Sean of Sean Astin. Yeah, he was oh, good. Oh, he was so good. Because yeah, he, he was in The Strain. I don't know if you saw that, but The Strain, uh, the guy who made Pan's Labyrinth, the director guy... Uh, Del Toro, yes. So he did a series called The Strain, which is kind of about these kind of sort of monster vampire kind of things. And uh, Sean Astin was in that. He didn't do anything with the character. It was awful. It was a real sort of kind of a career low, I thought. Mm. And then he turned up here and was like, oh, oh, brilliant. Absolutely loved it. And kind of, it, when you watch Lord of the Rings... Um, Samwise Ganji made me cry quite a lot just of his love for Frodo and all that oh, and he's kind of I've those whole films made me this. cry they went on, on <laughs> yeah, he on, did on. but no I thought he was really great in it. I really loved the fact that he was there alright so we got, we've got an email um, from a guy called um, Cab Holly who gave us a bit of a review about Stranger Things it's pretty long so I've chopped it down a little bit but I'll just sort of read you guys a bit and see what you think mm. Right, Stranger Things 2, appropriately referred to as a sequel, it does everything a good sequel should do. It expands on the world, the characters, and the overall feeling. Nothing has been lost in the time between seasons. The Duffer Brothers continue to subvert expectations, all the while giving us what we wanted to see. They've walked the line perfectly between fan service and storytelling. It's a high-concept science fiction horror story about another world attempting to invade our own world, only to be fought by regular folks and someone with a gift. It's a story we've seen literally thousands of times. Yet, with the amazing storytelling skills of the aforementioned brothers and Sean Levy, the tremendous acting skills of the entire cast and the great effects work were given an enthralling new take on an old story. And it doesn't hurt that the show not only acknowledges and even advertises the works that came before it. In summation, it's one hell of a show that, uh, that I think virtually any viewer can not only get behind but potentially fall in love with, as I'm sure many have. P.S. Love the podcast, guys. Keep up the banter. Keep expanding, and I'll keep listening. Well, there we are. Nice. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, it's great. Right. Summed it up. Yeah, I, I liked it. It's all right. Right. We'll keep moving on. Uh, right, so another bit of news. Sharda has come to DVD. I got my copy yesterday, which will mean absolutely nothing to you. You want Sharda, James? <laughs> okay, so in, what is it, 1977, 1978, uh, there were loads of strikes at the BBC, and um, mm. one of the uh, final stories of a season of Doctor Who, starring ah. Tom Baker, um, was halfway through the production, and it had to be cancelled due to strikes. So it's basically half of it is just sat around for years, and they did like a, a VHS release with Tom Baker like filling in the missing scenes, and then about 10 years ago, they did a, um, an online version, a webcast, with Paul McGann playing the Doctor in, in like the story. Mm. And now they've um, basically animated all the missing bits. And they've got the original, the surviving original cast 
back in to voice it. Oh, fantastic. So I've watched a little bit of it. It's pretty good. Um, I mean, you have to forgive, you know, Tom Baker is clocking on a bit now. So mm. his voice, you know, he's, he can't, he can't, you know, he's old. You can tell he's old. But... They should have got, uh, is it Ian Coleshaw? Yeah, John Coleshaw. John, John Coleshaw. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, no, I think it's going to be good. Who wrote that particular story? Douglas Adams. Ooh. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that makes yeah. it more interesting for me. Yeah. I like Douglas Adams. Yeah. And did, it, did you watch uh, Dirk Gently? I saw the first season. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. Is there a, is there a second season? They're, I think they're, they're either filming it or they are post. Right, okay. Did What's you enjoy this? it? I, it I loved one, it. It's one of those adaptations that I did enjoy it, but mm-hmm. it, it, it's never going to quite be... Because there are two adaptations, actually. Are you talking about the, the British one or the American one? I'm talking about the American one with... Uh, Can't remember the guy's yeah. name. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Those actors, yeah, yeah. We What's really need to get on top of this. <laughs> we really need to know who's <laughs> yeah, involved. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah, so I really did enjoy it. Um, but I think with so... that There are certain writers who... When you have a, a novelist, the medium they've chosen is deliberate, right? They, yeah. The novel or the book or whatever is is a different way of telling a story to TV or film. Yeah, yeah. And the trouble in transitioning one to the other, I think if you are a fan of the original work, it mm. becomes apparent. Yeah. Okay. And, and did you feel that that's something you've definitely just, felt while it, you were it, watching it? It just didn't... It wasn't quite, for me, yeah. Douglas Adams on screen, which, right. but then that's, that's really difficult because yeah. the guy is a genius in many... was a genius and in many ways. Yeah. What are you talking about Say it again, I didn't hear what you said. Dirk Gently. Which, Dirk Gently. Yeah, which was uh, when Douglas Adams, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, when he was writing for uh, Doctor Who, which was only a fairly brief period, yeah. some of his ideas he came up with were pretty w- mad and out there. And right. the BBC were like, uh, yeah, no, we're not having a kitten that turns into a shark and eats people in the air. We're not, that's not really very <laughs> Doctor Who. And so he developed this other character which, you know, there's some timey-wimey Doctor Who-y type things ah. in it, but it's more mad, more out there. Yeah. And he's a bit young and cool and hip and a bit more like what Doctor Who is nowadays, actually. Yeah. Um, well, I say young, hip and cool. Obviously, Capaldi is hip and cool. Um, yeah. But it, it just, I thought it was a really quirky, cool character that's kind of not, you know, there's so little machismo or kind of, uh, yeah, I'm going to, you know, he, he d- gets things done by being weird and quirky and unusual and strange and a little bit, you know, sort of a bit of a nerd and it's yeah, just, yeah. but just in a brilliant way that makes the do get done so I, I really enjoyed it mm. and I have, having even watched it I said that's brilliant my kids are into Doctor I've got to sit down and watch this with the kids and I sat down and watched it and of course the first five minutes are just like oh my god there's blood and guts everywhere <laughs> and dismembered bodies and I've turned it off turned it off and the kids are still like in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. That sounds cool. I've never heard of that. that sounds cool. Right, we better get on with things then. So, uh, yeah, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and review mm. the movie Crash. Yeah. All right, we're back. <laughs> 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 that was exhausting. Right, so Laurie, this was your. You just put your clothes back. <laughs> yeah. good. This was your pick. Yes. Tell us a bit so I it. picked Crash. Um, so, obviously, we are the movie lighthouse, all right? So we are here to shine the light through the fog of film, is that correct? Yeah, I said that at the start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's what we're doing. We're highlighting films that we feel, you know, are definitely worth a watch. You sound also, a bit defensive already. Yeah. Wait! <laughs> wait, because, you know, the, there was a moment where I thought, well, is this, you know, a little bit... I don't know. Um, but anyway, so we've got Crash, uh, David Cronenberg's film. Uh, at the time when it was released, you know, it was controversial. Um, I think that obviously the Daily Mail... And the Evening Standard. And the Evening Standard were trying to do everything they could to apparently ban it. Don't quite know, bless their cottons. But anyway... Um, Mary Whitehouse was still in effect. Right. Yeah. You know, okay. there's still that attitude in those kind of pressure groups of... Yeah. Uh, you showed some stocking tops. Awful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, and this is what I say, though. I mean, like, uh, for me, you know, as we go around, we, we, you know, each of us will make suggestions for films and stuff like that. But I think this is a film definitely worth mentioning and highlighting and watching um, because it, 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 it talks about a lot of stuff that I think actually are, are quite important in what's going on nowadays uh, in 
you know, in life, in humanity. But tell um, us what it's about. Okay, Crash, uh, I can't remember what number film of Cronenberg this is, but in um, 1996 it was released. Um, it has. Can we start this whole bit again? <laughs> Should we eat or not? No, 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 no crack on, go. Just, what's the film just, about? Just tell us what it's about, Laurie. Okay, right, okay. Based on a book by J.G. Uh, Ballard, written in 1963. Essentially, J.G. Ballard wrote this book, which, which was sort of an invitation into looking at how technology can effectively pervert us, all right? And he was using the, the automobile, the car. Louis, yes. what's the film about? <laughs> but, for God's sake, man. Just imagine you Tell haven't us what seen the film's it. About. Imagine you haven't seen it. And then, and then you could get as deep as you want. But what is it about? It's basically about how technology can pervert us. If we allow technology... Um, it's about people who get off on watching car crashes or getting involved in car crashes. Oh. Is it? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, OK, right, yeah. In a nutshell, it is that. It kind of is that. Yes, 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 it is that. People getting perversely uh, knocked off by the experience of smashing into other people and coming very close to that death moment and then becoming addicted to that and becoming perverted by that. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 it is that. But I suppose the original work, as I say, by J.G. Ballard is, is really how, you know, in 63, effectively, the car's still quite a new thing, isn't it? You know, we're, we're you know, everyone... Certainly, certainly a new thing for this. everyone having a car. Yeah. That idea yeah. of lots of people having cars as opposed to... The, the village nurse and, a, and, a, and some big wig having a car. It was, exactly. When it was really starting to become a normal thing, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And effectively this virus in humanity across the world, cars, 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 more cars, more cars. And I'm not a driver, but obviously, you know, I know what it's like to sit in a car. You kind of, you're in your perfect little shut-off world in a way. And then you get this character that experiences a crash a very, very bad crash, nearly dies, witnesses someone dying right next to him, covered in the guy's blood. And from that experience, um, is changed, effectively. Right at the beginning of the film, though, you learn that this dude is a deviant. He's a sexual deviant, yeah. as is his wife. That's what they do, all right? But now he's taken into a whole new kettle of fish after this crash, as it were. So I, then we go into that. Well, I think it's interesting you saying about them being deviants. Mm. Because I guess it depends on your interpretation of that word. But ah, the, yeah. the open, so I, I think there are two ways to look at this film. You can either look at it really superficially, in which case it's a weird thing about a group of people who get their rocks off through car crashes, mm -hmm. and, as you said, proximity to danger and death and all that kind of thing. Mm. Or you can start looking at it at a deeper level. What's it trying? What's Cronenberg trying to say? Yeah. And that your deviant comment about um, Deborah Runger. Unger's character and James Spader's characters. It, the, the the opening scene is Deborah Unger yeah. having sex in a in an, an aircraft hangar, right? Yeah. And the second scene is James Spader having sex in a, a back room of a mm. film set. But if you look at those two characters, they look appear completely disconnected to the activity that they are partaking in. They're not actually interested yeah. in the they're other person they have Exactly. Sexually. So they're, that, what they're interested in, it seems to me, is that they're both in situations where if they, they could get caught, there's an element of danger, yeah. an element of, and it's almost like that kind of that's something we could probably most of us relate to in some way, that idea of adding a bit of extra danger and excitement to it might be arousing. Whereas with a car crash, you've just gone so far into the danger and uh, not excitement but the fear element that where's the sex gone? Where's the yeah. passion gone? And I think that's what was interesting about it. It's moved to a level where you're completely divorced from the action of sex. Exactly. Mm. So those first two scenes are establishing the fact that we've got these two characters who are searching for something, that the, the, the mundanity of normal life yeah. is not enough. Yeah, yeah. Don't, they they mm. need more. And they come back and compare notes, don't they, exactly. on, the, on the balcony. They're yeah. both so, sort so, of together, but... So that for us, you kind of go, well, this is, this is different. This doesn't form the normal relationships that we're all used to and we're brought up to believe in. Mm -hmm. And then as you say, Nico, what happens after that is mm. this massive divergence off into, well, you're looking for something different. Mm. Here it is. Yeah. 
this is something completely different to explore, and that's where we get those kind of feelings of it's a deviant film, it's perverted, it's this, that, and the other. Yeah. But, and it's easy to attach those tags to it. But if you're, if you're looking at what Cronenberg is investigating with that concept of this film, mm. I think you kind of have to take away those tags because it's, it's not just about that, which is what the Daily Mail and the Evening Standard got up in arms about. It was like, these people are perverts, we shouldn't mm. be exposing mm. yeah. society yeah. to this interesting concept of actually we're all looking for a bit more because the society we've built is numbing. It's not yeah, exciting yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's really safe. We, we, you don't have to spend energy or time surviving anymore. So where are we getting our kind of influences and where are we getting our excitement yeah. from and, yeah. and the purpose for being? That's it. And yeah, I think, I think that's it's, good. Another interesting thing about it is if you want to make a film about fetishism of some kind, not about a specific thing for a specific market, like, you know, here's this thing, it's for people that like dressing up as dogs or whatever it is. You know, if you want to make something that's just about the idea of it, if you make it about an existing fetish that lots of people have, then it's kind of going to be a titillating movie for a lot of people. Whereas if you make a movie that's ultimately about a fetish, and I bet you the number of people out there that have a fetish for anything to do with car crashes, I bet it's small to non-existent. <laughs> and I didn't really think that existed. No, I, you know, I've always I said, if you can imagine it, there's websites dedicated to it. But I, doubt, I haven't searched. I doubt if there are many fetishy websites for car crashes. I think that's just... Mm. too a, much of a job I think, so by making a film that explores fetishism through something that nobody is actually going to have a fetish for it kind of really starts looking at the question of why do we pin sexuality to things that aren't sexual why would I don't know someone get in, excited by leather gloves or something like that when it doesn't actually have anything to do with the act of sex and that's I think really for me what the film is largely about is about what's going on how does such a big mm. emotion from one area gets sub- subverted into something completely different. Mm. I found it a bit depressing, really. I didn't well, come no. away thinking, oh, yeah, that was really good. And, and I watched it, I remember seeing it when it first came out. Yeah. Because obviously there's that scene where uh, the guy has sex with the wound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ro- Rosanna Arquette's mm. character, yeah. Gabriel, is a, um, a crippled, I guess. Prob- we, you, you never find out what it was. I don't think you find out what it no, was. No, there is a... A car crash. I was... Oh, so that would make sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> but no, my point is, throughout the film, there's a lot of... Um, they, they're they not explaining everything. There's a lot of stuff that... Yeah. This is just about the environment that these people are yeah. in, yeah. in real life. You don't find out about Deborah Unger's job. Mm-hmm. You don't find out about the Vaughan character. He's, he's had a whole mm-hmm. load of jobs. But they never pin him down to one thing specifically. This I think he was an air, air, air traffic... Analyst or something like that. Yeah, and a, a photographer. A, a yeah, some yeah. description. Um, yeah. But yeah, anyway, she, Gabrielle has a, a, a very pronounced scar, and that scar is down her leg. Really, a Cronenberg wound. Yeah. It's just it's it's beautiful. And the, <laughs> and the scene where Ballard Spader's character and Gabrielle are having sex in a car because basically they all shag each other yeah. everybody has sex with everybody yeah and there's the the uh, I guess the unusualness and well, that's not the right word but they're having to escalate what they're doing more and more to fully experience the mm. the sexual gratification or explore it that he ends mm. up having sex with her leg scar yeah so, I mean you say it was a bummer I no I don't, I don't think it's really a film about fetish it's, it's obviously there's it's playing more on like I say about the way technology can pervert us and it's that sort of exploration into obviously just using the car I suppose as that sort of narrative obviously in, in tandem with sex because they're constantly at it but you say it was a bummer and effectively that element is a bummer I suppose the way we can be manipulated and changed obviously nowadays with the with the phone, what that's really become, you know, I have kids and stuff, it's like, hmm, where, where's this all going to go? Mm-hmm. You know, it's getting a bit weird. But, um, but yeah, that, that, that element is a bummer. But you've got, you know, James Spader has this massive crash. So their relationship, him and his wife, they were doing their thing. Now he's off, he's off on one. So she's got to make that conscious decision, okay, do I follow him? Yeah? And it's kind of her story, in a way, following her husband... And she gets to that point, you're right near the end, 
Finally, she has a massive crash. She nearly dies. And they get to shag and be together at the end. Happy ending. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lovely, wonderful love story. You know, kind of thing. So, just moving on a bit. <laughs> what, what, do, what do we think of the performances? Do we like... like <clears throat> Brilliant. I thought they were good. I oh, thought they yeah. were good. Brilliant. Vaughn, come on. Yeah, he was very wow. good. Wow. Yeah, I think he was my favourite. Yeah. I think it's something that I thought was quite interesting about it is it is kind of pre-internet, or certainly the very yeah. beginning of oh, the yeah, internet. Oh, yeah, definitely. So um, there was still this kind of role for titillation in movies that kind of doesn't exist so much now. You know, if you want to see things titillating, you can easily go and do that. You don't need yes. film directors yeah. doing it for you. And... Uh, so there's still these kind of lingering views of a stocking top and all this kind of stuff, which I think exists less now in uh, cinema releases. Um, but also, if you were to ask the internet, you know, of your own algorithms, hey, Google, come up for us with what you think would be a great film for human beings. You know, the, the Google would think of all the traffic it gets and goes, well, you love watching people having sex. You <laughs> <laughs> love cars. I mean, yeah. and, and you love people falling over and having accidents. I, if, I hear you even find it funny. Wow, this you is know, great let's put it all together and make this movie for you. And what, you know, what you'd get is this thing that you're like, well, that's completely dry and meaningless and it doesn't do anything for me. But it's all the things you love. You know, and yeah. so in a way, I think that's... a. Uh, with a bit of distance of time I think that's a, an interesting way of looking at it um, but it's still for me it's still a bit left me feeling cold and if yeah. you know, that's, 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 that's I that's certainly wasn't me. driven to say I have to kind of watch all of this through until it, it was you know I, it wasn't by about halfway through it I wasn't really that into yeah. it anymore to be right. honest but I, oh, I, I think that's that, I loved what it. I kind of came away from that's almost felt like part of the purpose of it you're not mm. supposed to come and bounce out of that film kind of going that was amazing everybody's got to go and see it it left me yeah. feeling up yeah. and happy yeah. and all these different emotions that, that I, I think I read into it that, that Cronenberg is, is getting at the point that technology drives distance so mm. emotional distance so yeah we can get from here to there much quicker and we're connected via Skype to people on the side of the world all that kind of stuff but fundamentally it drives us emotionally apart yeah, and forces us to look for that kind of emotional connection and excitement in places that we previously didn't have to or, or would never have occurred to us. So for me, the, the performances are really cold. Yeah, mm. and very, but they're supposed yeah. to be, yeah. and they're, they're delivered, I think, brilliantly. The guy who plays Vaughan, um, Elias Cotius, mm. I've completely butchered how you pronounce his name there, so apologies. I think he's the most animated of them all because he's. He's the puppet master of this yeah. auto crash eroticism or whatever mm, it is. Mm. So he's the one who draws them in and pushes them out and pulls them back in and moves them around and takes them further on this journey. Mm. But even he is still this kind of sociopath. <laughs> right. I saw him as sort of like this sort of sensitive, extra sensitive character that was obviously just aware of really what the car's doing kind of thing and just obviously really went with it I mean I, the J, was it Gene Mansfield crash that bit that's where the film really Gene Mansfield I think was it Gene Mansfield, Mansfield. Yeah. that moment I just I absolutely loved it I, just, I love the set pieces of the film. crashes right I think I think we better score it okay alright and uh, you can you know give a little final thought so Nico I'm going to come to you first out of, out of 100 out of 100 please 55 55 how come um, I enjoyed it I liked it I thought yeah. the characters were good I wasn't really gripped by it and I think the idea that um, you know it's not meant to be gripping I think things can be dark and unpleasant and still really draw you in in a way that you then are left slightly questioning yourself for enjoying it so much whereas I think this the coldness I felt rubbed off a little bit yeah do you think you come back to it and watch it again yeah I could do yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> with the with the I think that last question is quite an interesting one because I was going to score it early 60s. Yeah. Um, but would I go back and watch it again? Probably not. So I'm going to reduce my score to 59. Okay. Are you doing maths? I'll do, we go. I'm doing maths as well, oh, yeah. <laughs> you screwed it up there. I've got to start again. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, I'll, we... get to my, I'll get to my score. In. So I, I love a film that has... You know, it can, it can it has nourishment, and this, this film it challenges you. It makes you think of stuff, albeit it might be stuff that not happy-go-lucky stuff. But it is a challenging film, and I got to the end of it, and I felt, you know, 
my hour and a half to two hours kind of had you know a purpose to it um i really enjoyed it i thought it was really well made the acting was great um but it's possible it's been said that this is one of Cronenberg's sort of most perfect films and when i think about it yeah i mean every single scene had a movement and an arc was abrasive was challenging um so I, I'm going to score this quite high. I think I'm probably going to go. Yeah, I'm going to go 81. 81. That's really, really quite high, isn't it? But um, well, that's your choice. Yeah, that's all right. Good. It is one of those films you wouldn't go, want to go running back and seeing again. Ooh, ooh, but I think maybe you know, ten years time. Let's see where the iPad goes. Let's yeah. see how our children's heads start growing, and then maybe I might want to go back to it again. All right. Now, I'm, I'm, for the same reasons that we've all said, really, it, it did leave me kind of cold, but I did appreciate the film. And, there, you know, when I think back to it, there were some really striking moments, especially mm. the James Dean crash and, you know, um, all the kind of slow, slow subversion into that world. So I'm going to give it 63. It's okay. kind of, I think it's one of those films that if you're after just a no-brainer, we mm. just want to be entertained for an hour and a half. This, this is, is not, not that film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But if you want a film that actually gives you an opportunity to, to start interrogating your thoughts on certain things, the yeah. subjects it raises. I think it's a really interesting film. Absolutely. Right, so that means that um, the Lighthouse Appreciation Rating is 64.5%. That's pretty which, good. Which is pretty good. Are you sure about that? I'm definitely sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Please so, um, write in if I've got it wrong again. <laughs> yeah. uh, but... If we uh, put it on our leaderboard, that means it's at the top. It is at the top. Wow. Yeah. Well done, Crash. Yeah, yeah well, well done, crash. crash. You are in the lead. All right, so all that's left to do is to ch- uh, choose next time's subject. Okay. I have my bag of balls here. There they are. Right, and it's Wyndham's pick this time. Okay. So, no. You, oh, do you get to pick the ball I as well? Pick, I get pick, to pick the ball well, if you want. Yeah. I thought I rummaged in your book. You picked the ball last time, right? Yeah. I don't know. Pick a ball. Pick Who pick, you pick Crash. I, I don't know. I don't know. No, no, no. Laurie pick Crash. No, no, no. Pick it's your pick. Oh, right, pick. okay. Well, it doesn't matter. We don't know how this process works. Okay. Let's hope we don't get another 90s film, for God's sake. I have either, so we've got a bit of wiggle room here, <laughs> 99 <laughs> or 66. <laughs> it doesn't right. have anything to well, do with it. Well, it, 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 does, it, does, it doesn't go up to 99, so it's got to be 66. Okay. Ah. I thought you said there were 100 balls. Uh, there are 90 balls. All right, so 66 is 1966. Oh, wow. Right, okay, okay. so uh, we'll be back in a minute with our selections for Wyndham's Pick. Lighthouse. All right, and we're back. So we've got our choices. Wyndham, it's your call uh, this month. Okay. Um, so, let's go in clockwise order. Laurie, your choice is? <laughs> I've got six. Right, we'll choose one. <laughs> Quick. Oh, this is tricky as hell. Right, okay. So, I'm just going to quickly zap through the ones. No, no, we... no, just choose one. Oh, can I just say no, no to the shout No, the end? no, because we've got our choices. Choose one film. Mario Barthers, Kill Baby Kill. All right. Okay. Okay. I've never heard of that film, by the way. It's a cracker. Yeah, I'm sure it is. (laughs) I'm I'm, going to go for Dalek Invasion Earth 2150. It's a brilliant film. It's got Bernard Cribbins in it. Peter Cushing. Are we doing the pitch as well? Yeah, well, yeah you've done your pitch. That was great. What? <laughs> uh, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and it's the Daleks in glorious Technicolor. It's brilliant. And it, there's so much to talk about. It's such a good film. Okay. Um, I don't mean to disrespect anybody's choices. Please don't make me watch a Dalek movie. <laughs> <laughs> don't influence Wyndham. All right. Wyndham, it's entirely up to you. I wouldn't like to influence you to, well, just say what to your not film make is. me watch a Dalek movie. <laughs> Um, I'm going to suggest François Truffaut's Fahrenheit 451, which is based on a Ray Bradbury novel. And uh, just to give you an idea of the vibe of it, the original posters from 66 said, A flame with excitement and emotions of tomorrow. So if that doesn't make you want to watch it, I don't know what does. Is this the one on the train? I don't know. You don't know? No. Okay. 
I haven't read the book, I haven't seen the film, I'm aware of it. Apparently Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit 451 is the burning point of paper and it's about a society where, where books are banned and that kind of intellectualism is banned and so it's a writer writing about That's books being burned. Thing. Okay, yeah. cool. Do you right. want to say anything about I'd have to do my schlock on, right, Kill Baby Kill, Mario Bava. It's a horror. He's an Italian director, so it's a giallo film, arguably. Um, and it's basically this sort of gothic town, and there's a ghost of a girl that is haunting the town. Ooh. Really great. I think the film's <laughs> inspired... <laughs> Brilliant pics. People cite it as point. David Lynch. You'll see quite a bit of sort of Twin Peaks in there. Right, well, that's it. That's okay. enough. It's oh, cracker. Oh, 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 oh. Can I just okay. quickly... And can I say I, we shouldn't criticise other people's, people's of choices, year. regardless <laughs> of our views on Daleks or whatever? Oh, no, I'm you so can't sorry. tell. No, 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 no more listen. listen. No. I always get cornered by. We can, we can do it next. We can do it next month, but not now. Isn't the idea that we sell the idea of our films? We've sold them next month. No, we're not with them. Okay, right. So, this is actually a really easy choice for oh, me. Thank you, Win. Because um, I have read Fahrenheit 451. Ah. And I think it is an amazing book. I think there will be a huge amount to talk about. So, I'm going to pick yours, Nico. Thank Fahrenheit you very much. Fahrenheit 451. Right, so well, also, also, it's just been uh, put together for, they're making a, a TV version of it. So, when we've done it, you know, some, at some point later on, we'll be able to compare it to the, the Netflix or whatever version of it. Brilliant. All yeah. right, guys. Right. Well, I think that's it. That's it for um, cool. this episode. Um, have a happy Christmas, everybody. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Oh, I love Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it funny? festivals Merry we Merry Christmas. Ah, I'll see you all soon. Happy James. Oh, I'm Nico. I'm still Anne. Yeah. You've it's, been Nico because uh, you're going now. But I still am Nico. Oh, okay. But thank you. Here I am. Bye. Bye then. I've been Romain Wyndham. <laughs> yeah, and I'm Laurie. See you later. Bye. Cheers. Lighthouse.